before Darwin, it was a fairly static clockwork universe. All of the species on Earth might have existed, as they now are, all the way back to creation. Changeless. In pre-Darwinian times, people knew that animals fall naturally into what we would now think of as evolutionary families. And they thought of them as trains of thought in the creator's mind. The, the, the creator's mind ran along certain lines, and that's why he produced uh, mammals. And then, then having had the basic idea of a mammal, he would then produce the different kinds of mammal primates and rodents and carnivores and things. So we're all on a kind of ladders, but it has also been called the great chain of being. The great chain of being had sort of God at the top and then angels and then man and then the other animals were arranged in a kind of, of ladder. There's always been a tradition which tended to look for a place for everything and everything in its place. A static kind of balance, unity, harmony and so forth. The Victorian establishment believed that just as God had ordained a natural order where each creature had its place, so the same was true in society. If you really want to understand the Victorians, think about all things bright and beautiful. The rich man in his castle, the poor man at his gate. God made them all high and lowly and ordered their estate. They were set in place. They couldn't move. They were being taught that they shouldn't even try to move. And that meant that real, real change was something that was very hard for them to cope with. So uh, whenever uh, observations about change would be placed before them, they would look for some way of showing that nothing really happened. In 1859, Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection dropped like a bombshell into a world ill-prepared to deal with it. Darwin was radical. His dynamic view was extraordinary. Nothing had ever been seen like it. Infinitesimal changes all the time, competing. One out of 10,000 might win out. Everything was moving all the time. If environment changed, species had to change and adjust. His was a dynamic view, radical. Darwin's theory upset the notion of a fixed natural order. Political thinkers of every kind were quick to seize upon it, to justify how they wanted society to run. What of course happened was that they cannibalized what they wanted from Darwinism. This always happens with political theories. You take what you want and ignore the rest. Darwin's struggle for survival became central to a middle-class struggle for power. New money challenging old money, where the fittest would rise to the top, the weak would go to the wall. These were the ideas of middle-class reformers, led by evolutionist Thomas Henry Huxley. The reformers loved it. It legitimized their political demands for change, bring in the best, make competition the rule, free and open competition. This was free and open competition in nature. Shouldn't we have it in society? But of course, the Anglican ruling class uh, disliked it because it upset their privileged position in society. It undermined it. But the new privilege of the middle classes was immediately threatened by more revolutionary interpretations of evolution. The working class, the inflammatory Democrats, of course, wanted to get rid of the whole system. Evolution for them was a way of getting rid of God. Therefore, he couldn't have ordered our estate. We're free to move up the social scale. You can understand their reasoning. Not for them, any sort of uh, competition, any struggling, any weak to the wall, they threw all of that out. There was a struggle to control Darwinism, and the winners were the middle classes. It was T.H. Huxley's interpretation of Darwinism that became the received wisdom. Darwinism starts off by putting a foundation to the whole meritocratic, professional, middle-class revolution, as it were. The middle classes were rising to power. However, once they were in power, the brakes went on. It stops here. 
And so the socialist revival in the 1880s, where they were demanding more votes for the working classes, a cooperative uh, society, they were marching to the millennium. Darwinism suddenly became useful to actually stop that in its tracks, and Huxley was the man. He was saying, you cannot have a harmonious cooperative society because it's always going to be competition. There's always going to be too many mouths to feed. Darwin proved this. So the rich man stayed in his castle, the poor man was at his gate because Darwinism proved for many people that the rich man was the best in doubt. He, he was the fittest in the struggle. The poor man lost out. Even Darwin believed this, and many of his supporters believed this, that the, in actual fact, the social setup had been set up by natural selection. So whereas God had fitted each organism into its niche, now natural selection with a capital N and a capital S takes the place of God and fits each organism into its niche. The argument had come full circle. The theory which had destroyed the God-ordained order of the aristocracy was now being used to prop up the new middle-class order. Social and political thinkers, like Herbert Spencer, argued for raw free market capitalism. Nature read in tooth and claw provided their justification. Social Darwinism, as it became known, was adopted by rich industrialists. For them, survival of the fittest was the scientific basis for a stronger society. Darwin calls the fittest people English, Anglo-Saxons, the wealthy, the intellectually superior. In many ways they were the Darwins, of course. It was Darwin's cousin Francis Galton who first proposed society should go beyond the idea of simply letting nature send the weak to the war. He said we could decide who the failures were and then help nature weed them out. Galton's hereditary genius was the work which established that um, important people bred important people um, and he was now using selection, Darwin's natural selection, to explain this. It's the origin of eugenics, the, the 20th century eugenics movement, which was strong in England, in America, in Germany, of course. Eugenics was predicated on the idea that mankind as a whole could be benefited by selective breeding. That's the same theory as has led to the breeding of cows for increased milk yield, horses for racing speed and so on. Galton visited prisons to photograph the people that he regarded as evidently inferior. He hoped to find the characteristics by which society could scientifically identify them and stop them breeding. I think people today are unaware of just how widespread eugenic views were among uh, sort of middle-class intellectuals in Europe and North America at that time. I mean, it doesn't, wasn't a right-wing thing in particular. I mean, the founders of the Fabian Society, the Webbs, for example, were, were militant eugenists. It, 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 it wasn't a, a right versus left thing. It was just a kind of conviction that we intelligent middle-class people must produce more of our kind and less of those stupid working-class people. Dreadful. Eugenics became a scientifically respectable international movement. One of its proponents was the grandson of T.H. Huxley, Julian Huxley. What is the bearing of the laws of heredity upon human affairs? Eugenics provides the answer, so far as this is known. 